Um, I will introduce our next keynote speaker, who is Howard Chang, who is here visiting us from his home base in Stanford. And like Nari, needs little introduction for uh, this particular audience. Suffice it to say that he is a serial pioneer in the non-coding RNA world, and not only the non-coding RNA world, there are many other contributions that he has made as well. Um, but it is very much an honor to have him uh, keynote this particular meeting. His talk will be titled Genome Regulation by Long Non-Coding RNAs, and he will, it looks like from his abstract, touch on his uh, recent work about the nexus between non-coding RNA biology and immunity. Howard. Thank you, Eric, for the very kind introduction, and really great to see everybody. The RNA world has undergone an amazing expansion. We now recognize that the vast majority of the human genome is transcribed in one form or another into RNA. And some of these uh, landmark discoveries are depicted in this cartoon. Now, if you indulge me, I want to organize kind of the fields of advances into a couple themes. Really, these are the special powers of RNA. In the first phase of RNA research, we found that the RNA is information really the central dogma of gene expression, the production of mRNA and, of course, ribosomes and spliceosomes. These are RNA machines that make the central dogma possible. Then, in the second phase of the last several decades, we learn about many other RNAs that are involved in gene regulation. You just heard this beautiful talk uh, on microRNAs. So, of course, microRNAs, long non-coding RNAs that act on chromatin, and uh, there are very many discoveries that are still unfolding. But a third and parallel power that I want to talk to you about today is RNA and immunity. Now, I'm not saying that just because we're all living through a pandemic caused by an RNA virus, and of course, uh, we're of course getting out of it with the help of an mRNA vaccine. But I want to posit that every RNA, no matter its function, needs to credential itself to the cell about its self versus foreign identity. And otherwise, they would evoke a powerful innate immune response. And so there's this very powerful link that I want to explore with you today. So let me then start with a very striking biological observation. That is that four out of five patients with autoimmune disease are women. And so if you're looking at this graph here, you can see that disease like lupus, the ratio is 9 to 1, female to male. The disease called Sjogren's, the ratio is 19 to 1. Some of you may know that I'm, a, I'm actually a physician scientist, I'm a dermatologist. Many these, of these diseases have a skin manifestation, and that's why these patients uh, come to see me. And so I've always been fascinated by this problem. Now, you may think that because it has to do with sex, it has to do with hormones, but in fact, it's probably really due to sex chromosome differences. So in, in patients uh, with an XXY genotype, so-called Kleinfelter syndrome, they're phenotypically male, they have testosterone, but they have a female level risk of autoimmune disease. So that says that there's something special about that, that second X chromosome. Now, this is really a double-edged sword. Uh, now, in the current pandemic, we found out that, of course, women do much better than men. Uh, sex is probably the second most important uh, feature, second to age, in determining outcomes. You can see that uh, men are much more likely to end up in ICU, much more likely to die. And there, of course, uh, by profiling experiments, uh, important differences in T cells that we can recognize. So if we're thinking about um, you know, uh, sex chromosomes, I really have to remind you that men have an X and a Y chromosome, whereas females have two X chromosomes. And so to make the gene expression uh, from this giant X equivalent to this tiny Y, the strategy in mammals involves a long non-coding RNA called exist. This is a 17 kilobase long RNA that's only transcribed from the inactive X. It coats the inactive X chromosome, as shown here, uh, and actually it's a um, very powerful. Just a few hundred molecules coats the whole chromosome and silences mostly the gene expression. And so there is a small number of escapees uh, which then define differences uh, between males and females in biology and disease. Now, to study X inactivation means that you have to follow two X chromosomes in the same nucleus. And so what we and others have done is to use a, what's called F1 hybrid. That is a, a cell derived from an individual that is the offspring of two parents with very different genetic backgrounds. And so there are lots of single nucleotide polymorphisms, so we can tell the two alleles apart using allele-specific uh, gene expression or chromatin analysis. 
So for example, a few years ago, my lab introduced a TAC-seq as a way to measure active regulatory DNA based on chromatin access. You can see down this TAC-seq map, uh, the x-axis, uh, this is all just genomic coordinates. The active X chromosome, the XA, has lots of accessibility, whereas the inactive X chromosome, the XI, has largely lost its chromatin access, except for the genes or the elements that escape X inactivation. And this analysis taught us that X inactivation occurs in pieces, just the promoters, but not the enhancers, escape X inactivation. This is really, in fact, a global 3D change in chromatin structure and nuclear structure. The inactive X basically coalesces, condenses, and moves to the edge of the nucleus, uh, touching uh, the nuclear lamma. This is called the bar body. There's also some contact with the nucleolus. So this is on the right is an image, uh, inside, uh, fish analysis. On the left, is, is, this is APEC-seq data, which is a method uh, that's location-specific transcriptional analysis. You can see that exists is the nucleus. It's touching the nucleolus. It's all over the nuclear lamina. But even though the nuclear pore is embedded in the lamina, it, the exist will not go into the pore, and therefore it's not exported, uh, and therefore excluded from the rest of the cell. Okay. And so it was long thought that exists would have uh, adequate protein partners. And so uh, many years ago, my lab developed a CHIRP-MS, which is an RNA-directed proteomic method. Uh, and this revealed that exists uh, has a large number of protein partners, 81 proteins, 10 of which through direct uh, RNA protein interaction, and the remainder through indirect protein-protein interactions. Now she mentioned that Mitch Gutman's lab independently did this analysis using RAP-MS. Okay. And so um, the challenge then was try to figure out which um, of these 81 proteins were important. And, th and there we had major help from genetics because we knew that among this 17 KB long RNA, there's a small piece called the A-repeat that was absolutely critical for gene silencing. And so if you have A-repeat deletion, the RNA was still spread coat the whole chromosome, but wouldn't shut down gene expression. And so we perform TREP-MS in full-length wild type exists versus a repeat deletion. And you saw that all these, so this is the peptide count, this is a scatter plot, so you can see that everything is on a 45 degree diagonal except three proteins whose peptide counts fall to zero, okay? And so this showed us two things. First of all is that exist RNA is modular. Different pieces of the RNA binds to different proteins, right? So you can chop a piece off and everything else is fine. Secondly, is that these three proteins, one of which probably would be important for gene silencing. And indeed, uh, we found that this protein SPEN uh, was critical for, for X media, for X inactivation, is the key executioner. Uh, and, uh, but remember this uh, in the second half of the talk. Okay. So SPEN actually turns out to be virtually a discoverer in Drosophila, it's a developmental mutant. But it's also a, a, a present in plants where its job is to silence transposons. So these are, this is a very ancient protein that has jobs beyond X chromosome inactivation. And so the human uh, spend uh, actually has been biochemically characterized as a part of a protein complex that interacts with uh, chromatin re uh, repressor complexes, uh, histone deacetylase complexes. And the structure is really ideal. The, uh, the N terminus of SPEN has four professional binding RM domains directly bind to the A repeat. Whereas the C terminus has the Spock domain that interacts uh, with these chromatin silencing complexes. Now, when we started studying this factor, Ava Carter in the lab, a very talented graduate student, was working with the SPEN knockout. So she confirmed that indeed the SPEN knockout cannot silence the X chromosome. But she also discovered that a large number of locations, uh, elements in the autosomes, also became active, gained accessibility in the SPEN knockout. Okay, so they require spent for silencing. And actually nearly half of these elements were from a single class of ancient viruses called endogenous retroviruses called IRVK. So we subsequently found that these ancient viruses that littered the genome, if they became active, they started making an RNA, spent would get on the job, recognize it with the RM domain, and shut them back down again. Now this is a critical clue because if you look at the sequence of spent, the A repeat, which is critical for gene silencing, actually has a lot of sequence similarity to uh, actually these ancient transposons, which is previously recognized. And so this really led to a model that X inactivation is an act of viral mimicry. And that is that there is a previously X-linked protein coding gene, the proto exists, which still exists in birds, 
But when this ancient virus jumped little sequences into uh, this proto-exist, it endowed the sequence with the capacity to now recruit spec. Okay? And when this sequence amplified and mobilized itself, it allowed this new link RNA gene, the exist, to now cause X inactivation. So in this model, exist is the device to trick a female cell into thinking that there's a raging viral infection going on on a chromosome. You can then mobilize this very powerful silencing machinery to accomplish the job of dosage compensation. So please remember this really as kind of an original sin uh, in the human immune system. Okay, so I told you about establishment. What about sort of memory? Okay, so X inactivation happens very early on in uh, the blastus stage in development. And then the memory of X inactivation, the chromosome is silenced, basically passes on in perpetuity to all the daughter cells for the life of the woman. Okay? So the dogma in the past was that exist was required for establishment, but no longer, but not needed thereafter. But uh, there's some evidence already going against that. And one evidence provided by Jeannie Lee's lab was that if you knock out exist in hematopoietic stem cells uh, in, in a somatic fashion, this will lead to disease. And I'll show you there are other evidence in humans as well that in patients, and there is basically evidence of leakage of the system. So for example, uh, if you look at B cells, cells that make antibodies, you'll see something uh, kind of intriguing, and that is that this exist cloud, so-called bar body, okay, is present uh, in, in some stage in the common lymphoid progenitor, kind of goes away for a while, but then comes back with B cell activation. Uh, and uh, furthermore, people have identified that in patient blood cells, that there's bilily expression of like receptor 7. This is a cell surface receptor that recognizes RNA that activates the immune system. Uh, and so this, uh, this is seen in female lupus patients. Uh, and this is specifically seen in a class of B cells called atypical memory B cells. We're going to talk about this more in a second. And, but this evidence was all correlated to date. So to get at this question, Bing Fei, you a very talented postdoc, set up a system where she can turn off exists by CRISPR interference. So this is using dead cas as a programmable DNA binding factor linked to a crab domain to shut down gene expression. So we were working in a human B cell uh, clone, basically, that is fully sequenced and phased and mapped. Okay, so, uh, so what she did, so I'm going to show you now two tracks, right, one track each for the inactive X or the active X. So in the control state, for example, TOLAC receptor 7, it's only expressed from the active X, not the inactive X. If you add DNA a methylation inhibitors, it looks exactly the same. But if you shut down exists, now a total like receptor 7 is reactivated on the inactive X chromosome, showing that there's indeed an ongoing need for exists for gene silencing. And it's not just the single gene uh, on the right, it's now it's a heat map, and there are actually hundreds of genes uh, that basically in this basically allele score, D score, the white color means bilateral expression. There are hundreds of genes that require ongoing exists for main, maintaining gene silencing. Okay, so what is EXIST doing? Uh, we found that in fact EXIST is needed to deactivate enhancers. So if you look at this enhancer associated histone mark, histone H3 lysine 27 acetylation, you can see that, uh, for example, that uh, it is actually active on the active allele, but gone in the inactive allele. But if you take, off, take out EXIST, then it's a reactivation of these enhancers on the XI. Okay? But in contrast, there's no change to other marks, for example, the polycom mark. Uh, we can also quantify that this is a predominant effect at enhancers, um, but less so at promoters. So this enhancer deactivation seems to be a principal job of EXIST. So since we're now looking at this role of EXIST in B cells, which previously not thought to have any function, we asked could EXIST have same or different partner, protein partners uh, in somatic cells. So, Yan Yan uh, Chi and Ansu Sapathi teamed up and conducted the CHIRP and MS experiment again uh, in uh, adult myeloid cells and B cells compared to ES cells. So we identify uh, actually over 100 proteins, uh, which then we think really gave a parts list of all the functions that exist needs to carry out. Um, and these include things like, for example, uh, nuclear matrix attachment, uh, RNA modification, chromatin silencing, gene silencing, and so forth. Now, uh, we of course then ask, are these the same factors or not? So this is another scatter plot. So here on the x-axis is the B cells, peptide count in the chirp MS from B cells. On the y-axis is the ES cells. So you can see that some proteins are present in both complexes. For example, SPEN 
is so very strong, number one in both cases. But you can see that this set of factors, for example, TRIM28, is only an exist partner in B cells, but not so in ES cells. And conversely, this polycomb R, PRC1 complex, RNF2, is only in ES cells, but not the other way around. It's not only an ES somatic cell difference. If you look in, for example, myeloid cells versus B cells, again, you see that uh, there are a number of cell type specific partners. Okay. Now, to understand which of these factors mattered, uh, Bing Fei went on to and silenced every single one of these partners using CRISPR I and asked would they reactivate uh, uh, basically excellent genes. So, this is a first allele specific CRISPR screen. So, you discovered that indeed a number of factors, including SPEN, was absolutely critical, as well as this factor TRIM28. Okay? Uh, and so, let me tell you a little bit more about that. So, this is a B cell specific partner that's required uh, for existing uh, activity. So TRIM28 is also known as CAP1. It's actually a very famous gene because it has a well-known role in ES cells for silencing endogenous retroviruses. Uh, we knocked out TRIM28 uh, in B cells and indeed reactivates HOLAC receptor 7. And so I'll show you, it actually silences excellent genes with a slightly different mechanism than the enhancer mechanism I just talked to you about. So now if you look at, for example, another uh, excellent target gene, you can see that TRIM28 protein directly occupies the promoters of these genes, but both the active X and the inactive X. Uh, but of course, what's different is the activity. So if you look at, uh, again, on these two tracks, that look at the RNA, uh, it's only transcribed from the active X, not the inactive X. But if you knock out TRIM28, now there's bilateral expression. So we worked out, in fact, that what TRIM28 is doing is activating, uh, working on a step called uh, promoter proximal positive. So RNA polymerase 2 will start on nearly every gene and transcribe by, uh, for about 100 nucleotides and then stop. And then it needs another signal to keep going. Okay? And so we found is that these TRIP28 dependent genes have a high amount of pausing as evidenced by this class of experiments called GROSSEQ or genome one right on sequencing, more so than independent genes. And so the model is that uh, these genes are pausing and then when basic, well, TRIM20 is already present, but if the exist complex uh, acts on, uh, interacts with it, it activates the activity somehow and enhances this PAL2 pausing. So this is a separate complementary activity, like a fail safe, right? If the enhancer fires, promoter starts going, another step to stop uh, the transcript for actually getting made. So by learning about the genes that depend on continual exist activity for their silencing, we actually got some interesting clues. Because we can immediately ask, those set of genes, do we ever see them in any other aspect of biology? And we immediately noticed that those same gene set was activated, induced in a number of autoimmune diseases or inflammatory diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and it's activated, for example, in lupus patients compared to healthy controls. We can also take this even down to a single cell level. So now we're, we're noticing that in COVID-19 patient, female patients, uh, that uh, this is seen in B cells. So let me explain what's going on. First of all, is that this is a UMAP. Every dot is a single cell. And these cells are being organized based on their similarity to each other. And second point is that we can see that there are naive cells that projected two orthogonal fates, one class of memory, conventional memory B cells and a second class of atypical B cells. And it is these cells that become atypical B cells that have the highest exist escape score. Okay, so suggesting that somehow uh, changing the exist status would affect this fate going to atypical B cells. So I have to explain what that is. So B cells are activated by B cell receptor antibody cross-linking and CD4 D ligation. That's the canonical B cells. But these atypical B cells are activated by different signals: toll-like receptor signaling and interferon gamma. And so, in fact, these atypical B cells, or ABCs, have been seen in, uh, with autoimmune disease and have antiviral specificities. But importantly, in animal models, they preferentially accumulate in aged female mice rather than male mice. So this really links with our theme. And so these are the markers that we use to follow these cells. And just remember this CD, CD11C positive uh, sort of class is basically the ABCs. So indeed, we can see these uh, cells escaping X inactivation uh, in pathologic cells from female autoimmune diseases, including, for example, in lupus, uh, nephritis. These are the, uh, the cell B cells infiltrating the kidney, and seeing especially again in, in, in uh, CD11 C positive atypical B cells. We also see the same phenomenon in rheumatoid arthritis in the knee infiltrating cells, B cells, 
again, escape uh, in atypical B cells uh, more than conventional cells. So this is not seen in every sort of female uh, disease state, right, actually rather selective. So that was a bit of, again, correlative evidence. So to directly prove that exist activities required to, to prevent the unleashing of atypical B cells, we carry out a primary cell genome editing experiment. So we obtained basically a, a primary human B cells from the blood bank, from female donors, and we developed a protocol to knock out exist A repeat uh, using uh, ex, uh, Cas9 RNP. We can rest and then stimulate these cells uh, with B cell receptor activation and TR7 agonism and ask, can we drive ABC fate? Okay, so as you can see in the bottom here that we can indeed expand, increase the population of these CD11C positive uh, atypical B cells. Moreover, these B cells undergo isotype switching. And so uh, B cells start with IgM, they can switch to IgD and IgG. These are sequential rounds of maturation, and we see definitely a substantial gain of IgG positive uh, atypical B cells. Okay. So these studies then suggested that, in fact, uh, the job of EXIST was not done since early in development. And in fact, there's an ongoing role with somatic cell specific EXIST partners. So in contrary to kind of that mono monolithic view of basically RNA protein complexes really exists a long line coding that has different partners. So this is more like transcription factors with coactivators, different partners uh, in different cell types. And the specific role then uh, in B cell release is that uh, TR7 is a very important target gene and that exists acts to prevent naive B cells from turning into atypical B cells. And this is particularly important, we believe, in situations with RNA ligand like COVID-19 or actually lupus or these other uh, diseases where there's autoantigens that have RNA and RNA binding proteins. Now, since uh, we've reported this work, uh, just last month, there's actually a report of rare patients with very severe lupus that are born with gain of function mutations in toll like receptor 7. Now, these patients partly also have massive expansion of atypical B cells, so I think that really validates this pathway uh, in humans as really, I think, an important mechanism to prevent autoimmunity. So these studies suggest really this role of the second X chromosome, right? If they become dysregulated, they might contribute to autoimmunity. But we believe that there's a further uh, very intriguing insight. And that is that when we start looking at the proteins that we pull out of these exist interactome, we notice that many of these top uh, interacting proteins are, auto, are also autoantigens. That is that patients with autoimmune disease develop antibodies against these cell proteins. So these are the proteins that physicians used to actually diagnose and stratify individuals with autoimmune diseases. So almost half of these top interacting proteins are autoantigens. Uh, these are very classic proteins like Rho and Law, some of Sandra's right in the front row, actually are in this part of this complex. And so this led to the hypothesis that maybe this exists RNA protein complex is a female-specific trigger of autoimmunity. You have this massive RNA, right, lots of repeats, 17 KB long, lots of copies of those RBPs. And these, this RNA now is sitting on a chromosome, right, again, over and over again, this highly condensed structure. And this kind of a polymeric repeating structure is the kind of complex that may be able to actually trigger the immune system. So that was the idea. So we first tested this idea to ask what would happen if you basically make cells die, right? If, if, they, if they lysed and they released antigen, what would this look like? And so coming back to our F1 hybrid cells, we can actually induce programmed cell death, apoptosis, you get DNA fragmentation, and then we can actually extract the DNA and ask, do these uh, different genomes fragment in the same way or not, okay, as a proxy measure of this kind of condensation idea. So this is what the data would look like. This is basically the molecular weight ladders, positive control, like basically nucleosomal patterns of DNA. And then these are our cells, and we make an arbitrary choice of greater than one kilobase or less than one kilobase. Okay, so we sequence, and indeed we discovered that on the X chromosome, we see an enrichment of the large fragments for the inactive X over the active X. Uh, and this is actually depleted with this small uh, size DNA fragments, okay? Now, if you look genome-wide, looking at the small apoptotic DNA fragments, you can see that on autosomes, the ratio between the two genomes are exactly one. Right? What do you expect? But looking at the low side that are silent on inactive X, we see a depletion of the small apoptotic DNA fragments. But this is not the case for the escapees that escape X inactivation. 
So in a way, this almost looks like an endogenous version of a taxi, right? It's basically the nucleases that chop up the DNA basically have the same kind of boundaries or the same kind of uh, parameters, uh, and so that these inactive X is harder to chop up, large fragments, uh, lots of antigen all coded together. Okay, so to really test this idea, um, we really thought that what we have to do, right, the most definitive thing is to basically make a male mouse and give it an exist RNA protein complex and see if we can give this male mouse female level of autoimmune disease. Now, this is a very hard thing to do. So if you express exist on any autosome or any chromosome, it will silence gene expression from the entire chromosome, and that is a cell lethal event. But now remember, I told you that the A-repeat deletion cannot silence it will assemble a 99% exist RNP. All the proteins are still there. And so that's what we decided to do. So it turns out that Anton Witzel's lab had previously made a A-repeat deletion TET operator conditional mouse. So we obtained this mouse from Anton, and uh, Diana Ju, a very brave postdoc, took this on to develop uh, this, uh, the, this next round of story with the autoimmune uh, model. Okay, so in this case, the, uh, the exist A repeat deletion is knocked into chromosome 11 with a TET operator, okay? So when we turn on docs, we can basically make a fake uh, exist RMP coding the whole chromosome. Let me just tell you that indeed, uh, there is a huge difference in the exist expression between uh, males and females, okay, black and red, okay? Now our exist transgene is a little bit leaky, and so even without doxycycline, there is a little bit of exist, but it's still 100-fold less than a real female cell. If you add doxycycline, now you get up to kind of the full level. And if you look in the organs, you can actually see these exist foci, the bar bodies start to form if you add, only if you add doxycycline. So let's keep this in mind. Okay. So now what do you have to do to get, get these mice autoimmune disease? So in fact, many mouse models of autoimmunity don't have sex bias. So we finally came to this particular model called the prostate-induced lupus model, which in fact does show this female preponderance disease activity shown here. So it has autoantibodies and organ disease, multiple organs. And this requires a very special genetic background called Smith J. Lambert, uh, and, and so uh, keep that in mind. And so we're going to test the impact of exist on resistant autoimmune genetic backgrounds. Okay, so when I say we, it's actually really Diana Dew. And so she basically uh, created all these cohorts, right? So basically we have our positive control, female mice treated with prostain. We have our negative control, male mice, uh, either with or without prostain. Then we have basically the treatment control uh, with only uh, basically prostain, but no, uh, uh, but wild type. And then finally the test case, male exists transgene doxycycline with prostain, okay? And so I want to give a specific shout out to Diana because she was doing these experiments and then COVID hit. Everybody got sent out of the mouse room. And so there's many, many dark and lonely nights only by herself carrying this experiment on. She made this happen. And so I'm about to explain sort of five, five years of her life in five minutes. So I really feel I need to give credit where it's due. Okay. So indeed, in this first, in this uh, genetic background that's resistant to autoimmune disease, the C57 black 6 background, we treated the mice with pristine, is the nonspecific uh, tissue damage. And basically, wait a whole year, there's no end organ disease, okay? Uh, but, importantly, we noticed that this was actually enough to cause autoantibodies. Okay, so these are the measurements of autoantibodies. What you want to look at is the female versus basically the male exists transgenic. And importantly, both the doxycycline-induced male and just the male transgenic, very low levels of exist was enough to give autoantibodies. Uh, these autoantibodies go beyond the protein of, of the exist RNP, so which suggests a possibility of something called antigen spread. Once the, the immune system gets started, it goes to additional specificities. So since they're autoantibodies, we can also look into the rest of the adaptive immune system. So if you look at in T cells from these mice, uh, we, we can now notice that in fact there are differences in their genome regulation. This is looking at ataxic CD4 cells. This is males, this is females. Uh, this is sort of the striking difference. Now if we actually then add on these different layers, we can see a partial reprogramming of the, of the male uh, chromatin accessibility pattern to resemble a female-like state. Now this is really a change in cell type composition. And once we do the DNA, uh, cell deconvolution, we really realize that with the difference, it was really a hyper 
frequency of naive CD4 cells and a change to a higher frequency of memory CD4 cells and between males and females, and that's being transformed also in our male exist transgenic. Okay. So now, uh, look, I should also add that there are also, are, of course, RNA differences that change in the pattern. For example, toll-like receptor 9 is now also flipped uh, from a low to high, uh, re in a uh, resembling the female state. And this is a toll-like receptor gene that's in T cells rather than B cells. Okay. So now moving on to the exact same genetic uh, studies, but now in the susceptible uh, SJL genetic background, we once again see, uh, after pristine treatment, autoantibody uh, induction, okay? Uh, but now, so here you want to look at females, these are the male controls, and the, red, the green over here is basically the males with exist transgene docs and pristine. Uh, the difference now is that instead of waiting for a whole year, now this happens in just 16 weeks, and the titer is much, much higher. So the y-axis used to be just a few hundred, now this is tens of thousands, and so it's a much stronger kind of response in this genetic background. And now moreover, we can actually see that there is in fact actually full-blown end organ disease. Now we're looking at on top at kidneys, this is the glomerulus, uh, and on the, in the middle row, this is the liver. So our animal pathologist has helpfully put on these little black arrows to show us where the, the pathology is. So you can see that, uh, the, for example, the liver, these basic evacuation is the, the, the result of uh, autoimmune damage. Uh, on the right-hand side is the total pathology score, scoring all the animals together. You can see that indeed, uh, basically females have very high level of uh, the disease. Uh, males much less so, but with the transgenic, uh, exist transgene, and uh, 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 pristine, basically can now convert to a female-like level of autoimmune disease. Okay, and so this now, we see an organ disease at kidney, liver, lung, and spleen, basically all over the body. All right, so what I've told you then is that we uh, really think that this exists RNA protein complex is a driver of female-specific autoimmunity. And it really can do this at multiple levels, right? At the beginning, it can just really start with making autoantibodies. Uh, this is then also associated with T cell chromatin changes, but these are not necessarily gonna cause disease. Only in the context of the right kind of genetic insult background or further tissue damage could you lead to full-blown autoimmune disease and, and organ damage, okay? Now, I should mention that this pattern of behavior is very reminiscent of some of the things we see in human autoimmune disease. So there are these amazing studies from the army where people get their blood drawn when they're first enlisted, and they get their blood drawn all the time subsequently until eventually they're discharged. Now, a subset of these individuals will get autoimmune disease at, when they're in the army, and you can go back in time, look in their blood and say, when did they first start having autoantibodies? When did they first start having disease? And the answer is that you can actually get autoantibodies years, sometimes a decade, before you get autoimmune disease. Okay, so this is a known phenomenon in human biology. And I think very interestingly that this mouse model is recapitulating this phenomenon that you start with this kind of break in tolerance, T cell subset changes, and finally uh, tissue damage. Now I think for men, they don't have exist, so they're missing some of this push, but that doesn't mean that they can't end up with the same problem. So other RNAs or other kinds of drivers would basically have to basically push this process along, and that might actually really suggest that this, is, this whole disease process is actually fundamentally different because it's driven by different causes. Okay. So um, um, I want to acknowledge the folks who did uh, some of this uh, really, I think, really interesting work. Uh, the work that I told you about for uh, X and activation and biomimicry was done by Ava Carter. Bing Fei Yu led the work on exist memory uh, in B cells, and Diana Ju led the work on uh, exist RMP as a driver of autoimmunity. I gratefully acknowledge my collaborators, especially Edith Hurd uh, and TJ Utz uh, at Stanford for the uh, last study, uh, and I gratefully acknowledge my funding sources. Thank you for your attention. Hey, that was really great. So I guess the Thank question you. about the, the first part, so that the classical evidence that exists is not important for, for maintenance. Is, is that coming, I guess, from MEFs? So I guess the question is, are the B cells the exception or are they the rule in terms of other somatic tissues? 
Yeah, I think, I think that's going to be the rule. I think the, the earlier studies were done looking at a small number of genes without modern technologies, right? And so once we, we have the resolution now to go in with modern day allele specific uh, you know, tools, you can clearly see uh, the, these escapees that, that require ongoing exist, right? Uh, and what we also learned is that the, the prior dogma was not wrong. Basically, the number one predictor of being, needing exists is basically low DNA methylation at the promoter. So basically, if you have no DNA methylation, then the only thing you depend on is exist, right? And so, and that makes perfect sense. Hello. Um, did, um, did you also investigate uh, the differences between female CD8 T cells and ma male CD8 T cells? Because as they uh, recognize antigens uh, on the cells expressing HLA-1, uh, they I think they're at least as, they should be at least as interesting as CD4 T cells. That's right. Uh, I agree, yes. So we're doing uh, all kinds of single cell, uh, everything right now, e every kind of cell in the immune system. So, so we'll see. So yes. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I was interesting, interested in the part where you uh, told us that the retroviral, endogenous retroviruses are important as part of the X inactivation. I was wondering whether in your mutants in the B cells you see upregulation of endogenous retroviruses, and if so, whether this also contributes to the autoimmune phenotype that you see. Ah, that's a good question. Yeah. So in fact, um, we um, okay. So two two things. One is that in the B cells we knocked out or inactivated exists, which obviously only acts on the X chromosomes. Now, if you knock out SPEN, right, in the animal, there's in fact a, 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 a strong B cell phenotype. And so whether that is purely because of SPEN's role on gene regulation and, and or due to like endogenous retrovirus reactivation, that remains to be seen. Yeah. Josh. Great talk, Howard. Um, the transgene that expresses exists, does it, what else does it have? I mean, how sure are you that it is the sequence that's coming from exists because you know it is a foreign transgene that is in the chromosome. Well, it's an uh, exist cDNA, but it's is, not foreign. Is there other stuff? I mean, no, there's a the, TED operator that's not enough. A TED operator, that's right. But obviously, that's controlled by the fact that you you only get a phenotype if you add docs, right? So the um, the it's not a foreign sequence because even in males, they have an uh, active X chromosome. They have exist. They just don't express it. Right, so every right, everybody has the same genome. Like males or females, they all have exist DNA. Um, but you, I guess it does come on though later, right? In a time when it's, um, I mean, it is like a for, in, in the sense that it's only expressed later in your in your mice. Right. Well, but, I was no, no. So, so I mean, I think that I, I showed you this example. The B cells where the exist goes away for a while. That's actually kind of the, the the exception. So most like female cells, you can detect exist expression. Right. It's the number one yeah. thing that separates males from females. Right. So, yeah. So uh, just a related question. Um, why do you think exist is special in this way? What's special? I mean, there's there are other long RNAs that assemble RNPs. So what is it? What is it about exist that makes it particularly adept at triggering this okay. kind of response? That, I think that's a very interesting question. I, I don't think we really have the answers, but I'm going I'm, I'm to like speculate, okay? So I think there's two things going on, right? One is that I told you about this idea about the X inactivation as viral mimicry. So that entire system was set up to basically deal with foreign viruses, right? And now you're using it in this in this way for, 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 for chromatin silencing, right? So, so all those components, all those kind of signals basically just tells the rest of the cell like something bad is going on, right? That's one sort of idea. The second idea that I talked to you about is the biochemical one, and that is that this is a very special structure. Like no other RNA has a chromosome-wide territory, makes the whole chromosome condense, right, into this structure. And in a way that basically when you try to kill the cell and release antigens, like basically the antigen release pattern will be different, right? You end up with much larger molecular weight complexes. So those are the um, two things, but can some other RNA do that? I'm, I possibly, very possibly, I don't see why not. Thanks. Yeah. We have to, Sandra, Sandra has a question in front. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Um, Nice talk. Um, have you looked in patient samples to see if the exist levels correlate, like you're um, suggesting, like in female patient, autoimmune patients? 
Yeah. So exist level in female autoimmune patients actually do all kinds of really interesting and different things. So I told you about this bile escape. So sometimes you see that the exist cloud is not there. Uh, sometimes people think that there is um, some other kind of problems with, with gene silencing, but you don't really see like more exist um, that in, in female in female cells in, from autoimmune patient samples. So you didn't mention interferon at all. Where does this fit in? I'm sorry, can you say the question again? You didn't mention interferon, which we know increases when a lot of RNAs accumulate. I can mention work from Nari Kim and Nick Proudfoot yep. on monogenic uh, inter interferonopathies. That's right. Yeah, I only briefly mentioned interferons in the context of atypical B cells, and that is that they can get activated by interferon plus toll-like receptor signaling, bypassing the need for CD40 ligation and, uh, uh, yeah, and other co-stimulatory signals. So um, that, yeah, so if you're asking about whether there are changes in interferon levels, like in, for example, in the exist mice, we, we don't know yet. So um, one of the uh, autoimmune uh, diseases is subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, which you probably know about mm -hmm. as a dermatologist, which I think is not female-skewed. Uh, female Can you comment? Okay, this is a very, very uh, detailed question. Yeah, so, th so there are different flavors of lupus, right? So this is one such flavor. Um, I always thought that that disease had more of a like infection association, right? Like bacterial infection association. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and right, it's basically like drug induced, like haptin, right? So, so that's very common as well. That's right. So I, I think, so I, I think that subset. I think the, the broader question is, okay, if, if this is a pathway, is this the only way to get autoimmune disease? And clearly that's not true, right? Like there are many, many other ways. Um, uh, that's correct, correct. Yeah. All right, well, a lot of great discussion. I wanted to let it run, but I think we're over time now. So we will thank Howard one more time.